Bobby. Get him. You are listening to Brave Talk Radio. You're just in time to join today's brave conversations with your hosts, Jackie Little Guest, Daryl Williams, and Tony Emma Hale. All right, it's another Brave Talk moment, and today we are talking and continuing this discussion on relationships. I have with me today Latonya Warsham, who has really become a staple of this show. I think she, I think she is Bogart in her way. Watch out. Hey, Latonya. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Doing good. And today we also have a special treat with Rodney Gray of Freedom Success Solutions, and he's also part of the John Maxwell team. So Rodney is joining us today to help us further this conversation on relationships. Welcome, Rodney. Thank you so much, ladies. It's such a pleasure to be be in your midst. Thank you for having me. Hey, this is our treat. Why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the projects that you're currently working on? Well, currently I have three book projects that I'm working on. Each of them I'm excited about for different reasons. One is uh, an e-book for men. It's titled Definition of a Man. Whatever defines you determines your destiny. And then the second one is going to be a motivational devotional. And then the uh, last one is going to be the character and currency of relationships. So I get an opportunity now to kind of travel around and and try to give that message uh, to different people in different parts of the country. And I've really been surprised at how well it's been received. So because it's been received so well, I decided to to turn it into a book. So I'm extremely excited about that, extremely excited. I'm excited about that myself. (laughs) Yeah, me too. I like the sound of that. Good stuff. I'm just thinking about some of the discussions that we have had over the past month leading us up to now and talking about relationships. And when you talk about the definition of a man, you know, I I look at broken marriages, broken families, broken relationships, children being produced out of wedlock. In one of our broadcasts, we kind of talked about, is this really a man that you're with? So, So when we Think about not just the male vernacular, but the definition of man and manhood. And I'm assuming that that's the epicenter of what your book is about. Uh, Yes and no. It's more of a book that teaches men that you can control what defines you. Your past doesn't have to define you. Uh, The mistakes you've made, your failures, they don't have to define you. You can choose to allow other things to define you. But know that whatever defines you, whatever it is, Whatever defines you determines your destiny, and that's the, that's the essence of what the book is about. So essentially, it gets men to, to, to know, uh, be honest with themselves about where they are and then begin to establish core values that can, in essence, make them uh, a better man. But they mm-hmm. have a choice to put certain things in place uh, that can define them and shape them and take them towards the destiny that they believe they were called to fulfill. That's good. That's good. Uh, it speaks to uh, a man's character. Absolutely. You know that. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely it does. But it, interestingly enough, uh, I was in New York in, in, uh, in Harlem back in March, and, and somebody raised the question, what's the difference between uh, manhood and fatherhood and, and different things like that? And, and a couple of the guys uh, defined the difference as uh, responsibility. If you're a father, then you have uh, a responsibility to children and so forth and so on. But when you're a man... You're responsible for yourself, and a lot of times, men, we don't, we don't take advantage of having the responsibility of taking care of ourselves, you know, when we're alone, you know, before we're in a relationship or before we have children. And then once we're in a relationship or when we do have children, since we're not good at taking care of ourselves or being responsible for ourselves, then we're ill-equipped uninformed to, to take responsibility over a young lady or over our children. So it was a very interesting conversation, an interesting dynamic, and I, I actually learned quite a bit uh, in that form, so it was great stuff. Well, I'm just thinking about that whole entire concept of, of probably the latter part of what you just said and being able to take responsibility of yourself before you take on that mantle of, you know, trying to build a family or getting into a relationship and and now carrying the responsibility of another person, so to speak, with you. And I think that kind of perfectly segues into where we ended off with our conversation 
on last mm-hmm. week's broadcast about these young people. And that's why I'm so intrigued and excited about the upcoming publication of this book because it really does define or help give guidance to men about what defines them. And and I know that you said kind of yes, kind of knowing about kind of that transition into manhood, but that taking of self-responsibility, that has to be the first part of it. And last week what we were talking about was how we can, as a community, those who are within or consider ourselves part of the body of Christ, how can we effectively touch the lives of our young people to transition their minds to become marriage-minded? The conversation kind of sparked when we looked at the incident mm-hmm. that happened a couple of weeks ago with the young girl. Where was that at? Uh, Fort Myers, Florida. Yeah, Fort Myers, Florida, young girl mm-hmm. in the bathroom that was, Uh, witnessed on video having sex with about two dozen little boys, one right after the other. And then, yeah, Yeah. we we started talking about how can we become more effective in the lives of these young people so that they have a greater level of respect for themselves. And, Jackie, you pointed out some very key points just about respect for self and one another. You want to bring us up to speed on what was discussed last week? Yes. Well, your, your self-esteem, where, where is your self-esteem? And if your self-esteem is down in your boot and you can't recover it, then what are you going to do? Where do you go to learn? Because it's a learned behavior. I don't think anybody is born that way. It's a learned behavior. This is what I know. This is what I've been around. So somebody has to teach. This is the way to go. If I don't know, then how can I teach my child? So there has to be a constant teaching and learning. First of all, I need to make the choice that I want to change. Because I can come in there all day long and talk to you, but if you don't have a mind that you want to change, then it will not happen. So there has to be a mind that, yes, I want to change. And there has to be someone that says, okay, we're going in and we're going to teach these women, these young girls. And I I just want to say something that I saw the other day when I was in the store. This young girl, she must have been mid-twenties, and she was working in the store, and this man, he had to be every bit late 70s, pushing 80, and he kept telling her, you sure would look good in those shoes. They were stilettos, and he just kept saying, you sure would look good in those shoes, and instead of her saying thank you and walking off, she said, yeah, I sure would like to have them, but they just cost too much, and it grieved my spirit. Because I'm saying, honey, don't you see he set you up? He is Uh. old enough to be your granddaddy. But he kept on as she was playing into it. Yes, I sure would. And I kept looking at those shoes. They just cost too much for me. And I'm saying, God help us. Because here is another girl that may fall victim. Here is an old man that you should be somewhere, uh, somewhere else. So who's teaching her? No, honey. Don't even play into it, even though she may not have gone that way, but don't even entertain it because you may entertain something this time and who knows what next time may bring. So that it's, a, it's a learning. It, they just need to be taught, but who's going to teach them? Mm-hmm. Even in the scenario that you just spoke on, Jackie, it's almost, I mean, this older gentleman needed some training as well. I mean, exactly. He was, exactly. He was setting her up just as much as she was setting Absolutely. him up. Yeah, yeah. From a male perspective, uh, Rodney, what do you sense was going on there? Yeah, de- definitely. It sounds like that. You know, his compliments were were, were self focused. You know, he he had an ulterior motive uh, by complimenting her. You know, it wasn't about you know what she needed per se. I think it, it was more about what he wanted. You know, and that and, and it's unfortunate. 
a lot of times, you know, you, you see adults that, that deal with children or interact with teens, and, and it's really about them, and it's not about the best interests of, of the teen or the youth. So I think that that was clearly what was going on in that case. Yeah, right, I can so agree I'm, more. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it it, yeah. it it is bad, and I think it does start at the young level. And, you know, again, talking about the resource book that you're coming out with, Rodney, I think that is good, um, as well as for catching some of these young adult men, young adolescent men and up. And what we've been talking about is how can we be more effective at reaching our youth so they don't grow up to have to be in some of the situations that land them into lifelong singleness. You know, I did a little bit of uh, research, pulled up some statistics uh, through Pew Research and the Census Bureau that estimate that approximately 70% of black women are single and 42% are unmarried. Now, there's a difference between being single and unmarried. And a single woman is a woman who has never been married. An unmarried woman just means that that's her current situation. She could have been married before. She could have been divorced. She could be widowed. Um, any number of reasons why she is unmarried, but just to make that distinction there. And we kind of need to get to the root of why so many of our women are living these single lives and remaining single. And I know they, you know, you, you hear, oh, single, saved, and satisfied. Okay, that's just a smoke screen. <laughs> uh, it, it is. That, that is just a smoke screen. And I'm going to tell you what the Bible, what the Bible yeah. says about this, and then we're going to go deeper into the discussion. But I want to use this scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, and this is how it reads in the message version, okay, because this is going to shape our conversations going forward. We want to take this Bible and we want to make it relevant to today. And it says, it's better to have a partner than go it alone. Share the work, share the wealth. And if one falls down, the other helps. But if there's no one to help, tough. Two in a bed warm each other. Alone, you shiver at night. By yourself, you're unprotected. With a friend, you can face the worst. Can you round up three? A three-strand rope isn't easily snapped. Now, I parallel the difference between marriage-minded, single-minded. According to this scripture, everything that would wind you up on that marriage-minded track we talk about being better, being warm. You can face the worst. You have a partner. You have a friend, someone to share life's burdens and challenges with. But in singleness, the very first word that was mentioned in this scripture is it's tough, cold, unprotected, alone, loneliness, by yourself. See, this is what happens when we go out and we sling these foolish words like single and satisfied. God never meant, okay, unless he gave you that gift of being a eunuch or that gift uh -huh. of celibacy, he didn't mean for you to live life alone because in Genesis it says it is not good for man to live alone, and that's why woman was created. So if we are raising our young people with this single-mindedness and thought, what are we really doing to them, and how can we make that shift? That's what's on the table. Let's talk about it. Well, you know, we talked about last week, uh, you know, the shift was, there was an urgency for the shift, but we also made reference to the church being the foundation by which we are being taught. Jackie did implement the fact that, you know, a lot of people don't know, but if we are spending a lot of our time in these places called church, that is, or in the church sector, as I always mentioned, then I, I want to make reference to the fact that that should be a foundational place to start where we can give these young ladies and young men tools to uh, reference and to use as guides to navigate their lives, which, of course, first and foremost is the Word of God. So you're saying that the church should be the primary area in which we take to 
use as a, a launching pad to to train these young people. What about home? Well, yeah, yeah. Let me let me be clear on that because see what I'm getting at really is the fact that we have tons of organizations out there that are feeding our young people different ideas, different concepts, different principles that are not Bible connected. So it can mis it can mislead them into taking measures that are not sound, they're not uh, correct, and they're definitely not leading in them to a right path. I mean, if you're talking about safe, satisfied, and what else is it? Safe, sanctified, and satisfied. Well, we already know the flesh is not satisfied. Yeah, safe, safe, satisfied, and single. So we already know, and I know I knew when I was single, particularly at the age of 25 or so, I was not satisfied. I was single, and I most definitely was not sanctified, and let's be real here. So, you know, that is a uh, truth to that because we have to show one another how important it is, not necessarily to become marriage-minded, but to build the character in which we can walk into that type of uh, dynamic, and that's that type of relationship, a marriage relationship, if we so choose to, the right way. Okay, so let's take that word character that you just mentioned there because, you know, I think we're progressing right on down the road to where the core of this discussion is because oftentimes we want our children and our young people to grow up to live the best productive and happy lives. But what they see at home does not necessarily mold their socialization abilities, skill, and their character as it relates to relationships and interaction with those of the opposite sex for the end game, okay? So I've heard it said in the past that oftentimes uh, mothers and women uh, who are raising young girls and, yes, even some young boys teach these girls to be that stubborn, disrespectful, headstrong, um, deceitful, hateful black woman that we see media perpetuating today that kind of keeps us on the lower end of the totem pole as it relates to relationships. So how does that play out in the home? It plays out in many respects because when you think about teaching character, if character does not reside in the parent, it most definitely is not going to reside in the child or the young adult. That is. Rodney, what do you think about and that? I, I, do do mothers yeah, actually teach their daughters to be like that? I, I think so. I won't I won't say I won't say it as a blanket statement, um, because I'm sure that, you know, there are some mothers out there, you know, that are that are doing their best in spite of what the world is teaching their child. But I think it comes it comes back to um the scripture, Tony, that I that, that you read because the what I what I heard stood was that that's true. Right, but the the the, the single saved and sanctified, that's a cliche. You know, get people to get people to, to feel good and, and it and it and it I think it kinda masks the reality of their situation. So so the truth is, as, as you read in scripture, is that it that it is tough. It is tough and, and it reminded me of, of uh, a devotion I was having the other day and, and I was reading in Proverbs and it said, Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Uh, but bind it about your neck and write it on the table of your heart. And and what I understood from that is that where where truth on the outside and where truth on the inside. In other words, make truth a part of who you are. And truth is a part of who you are. Then it's more recognizable to you. It's more recognizable in your situations, in your circumstances with other people. And if it's more recognizable, then it's more readily received. And then I I, I was reminded of when. Jesus was before Pilate, and Pilate asked him, he said, are you the king of the Jews? He said, you say that I am, but for this cause I was born. This is why I came into the earth, that I might witness unto you what truth is. He said, those who, those who are of the truth know my voice. And then, interestingly enough, Pilate, standing right in front of Jesus, says, what is truth? Mm-hmm. Truth is standing right in front of him, and he asks mm-hmm. the question, what is truth? So, so yeah. what I'm saying is, is, is that you know, it starts with the truth, right? As Tony just read in that scripture a few minutes ago, it starts with the truth. But beyond that, it starts with us as individuals being an example, I think, number one. Um, because, because you teach what you know, right, but you reproduce what you are. So our children hear us 
saying all kinds of things and teaching them all kinds of things, but they see what we do. They know who we are mm -hmm. at our core, so we mm -hmm. want to reproduce who we are. And I think beyond that, it is, it's about being available, being, more, being an example first, but being available to our children. And, you know, I don't have children yet, <laughs> but I, I believe that the greatest gift you can give them is your time. And I think right. beyond that, beyond that being pliable. In other words, I had the privilege of, of, of coaching a 10-year-old out of Arkansas, and uh, how I connected with him, when I say pliable, I mean don't just deal with them on your terms. Get into their world. Get into their world. You know, spend time with the things that, that fascinate them. And, and this particular kid had a fascination for a particular game I knew absolutely nothing about. But, but I spent time learning the game because I wanted to connect with him. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't want to go all I don't want to go all around the bush, but I think you know in order for us to be more effective, and I think once we can grab them, once we have audience and influence with them, then they'll listen to what we have to say as it relates to how to conduct yourself with people of the opposite sex. But I think I think we 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 try to go the route of this is how you should do relationships when they see how we live. So we can't mm -hmm. if, if, if how we live is off, they're not going to listen to what we say regarding relationships, particularly when, you know, that stuff is everywhere. Sex is on TV. It's in music. It, it, it's everywhere. But I think it's, it, this is important because we need to address it because we were created to be relational beings. You know, our, the, right. foundation of, the foundation of our existence was birthed out of relationship. God, God the Father said to God the Son to God the Holy Spirit in Genesis 126, let us make man in our own image and after our likeness. So, so that, is, that is relationship. So Without question, you know, we have to do better, but I think it starts by us being, being an example. And I absolutely agree with that on all, on all points. And that's why, and I know that we can look at the church organization and talk about what more the church can do, but, again, I think what we're seeing now in these disparaging rates between and ratios between not married before in the African-American race versus all other races. I mean, our rates have quadrupled versus what we see in other races. I think uh, in the past half century, only 9%, there's only been like a 9% dropping rate of marriages in the white race. But in our race, we're looking at numbers that have quadrupled. And we're going to go to a break in a minute, but I do want to share this point, and we can expound on this further. There is an author who came out with a book, and uh, his name is Ralph Richard Banks. And he points out that not only are black women the most unmarried group in America, but wow. they're also one of the least intermarries with other races. So his suggestion, his worldwide suggestion to this problem was that black women look to the white, Latino, and Asian race as potential mates. Is wow. that the answer? And see, that's why books like What You Have in Your Spirit That Needs to Be Birthed Out is so important. That's why broadcasts like Brave Talk and some of the other power church programs that we have that deal directly with women and teaching them with pliable minds to be the women of God that God has created them to be is so important. And you will never see, you'll never see a tagline on anything that we do that says something stupid like single, saved, and sanctified. That's a lie from the pit of hell, and it is against the word of God. Absolutely, because we were not made to be single in our walk on this earth. No, you, you weren't made to be on an island in and of yourself and by yourself. And even this scripture talks about having a friend. And I hear women, oh, I ain't got no friends. You know, people this, people that. No, you are lonely. You are bitter. And your life is tough. You're walking around here unprotected. Nobody to keep your back. Because you're running off some cliches that you heard people throw out there and you picked it up. So when we come back, we're going to talk about the answer that the world offers. And particularly this answer. And there's also that lie about there being a shortage of black men. So we want to talk about that when we come back, too. Mm -hmm. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
You are listening to Brave Talk Radio at TonyMHale.com. Today's broadcast has been brought to you by Next Level Plus Project Management and Business Consultants. Learn more about how Next Level Plus can help you solve the right problems and seize the right opportunities by calling 704-780-2997 or visit their website at nextlevelplus.org. Hi, this is Tony Emma Hale, and today I'd like to share pie with you. As you continue on this journey called life, I want you to remember these three words, presence, influence, and experience. Know that your presence will always make the difference. Nobody, and I mean nobody, can add to the atmosphere the unique qualities that you do. God has given you a very distinctive power of influence to wield in any way in which you choose. The only caveat, though, is that you wield it in such a way that it brings Him glory. In return, you reap the inheritance of eternal blessings that He has set aside just for you. Now, believe it or not, it's your life experiences that will guide you and prepare you for what you are coming into. In fact, experience is the primary producer of faith in the life of a believer. So build your faith today as you remember the importance of pie, presence, influence, and experience. This has been a Teachable Moment with Tony and the Hill. It's Brave Talk Radio on TonyEmmahale.com with your host, Daryl Williams, Jackie Little Guest, and Tony Emmahill. Okay, everybody, we're back here with Brave Talk Radio, and we are having some phenomenal dialogue today in reference to the foundational truths that involve our young people, where there's such a huge need for them to flourish in this lifetime and be able to survive, literally. I thank you, Rodney, for even bringing to our attention today your book because uh, that piece where you discussed the definition of a man, while there needs to also be some definitions put in place for women from the sounds of things. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. I think definition is certainly needed all across the board. I think that definition of... um A woman also comes with uh, women, young girls, from, from, from childhood on up, learning that respect for self, learning that respect for their bodies, learning that respect for, uh, how others perceive them and how they perceive themselves. And it becomes critical for us as adults in these young people's lives, you know, whether you're an aunt, an uncle, a cousin who's older, an older sister, an older brother, a parent, whatever that role is, godparent, that when you see some of these things trying to take place in that child's life where they're speaking negative thoughts to self, because it's always going to show on the outside. It's always going to manifest itself on the outside. Anytime mm-hmm. you see a little girl always wanting to control a little brother, always wanting to, you know, drag him, and when, when he doesn't do it the way she wants it done, she blows up and gets explosive. It ain't got nothing to do with little brother. It's what's going on inside big sister's mind. And when we mm-hmm. as adults see that kind of behavior, we need to address that on the child's level and figure out what, what exactly is she speaking to herself that would make her disrespect this other child. Because when we see children disrespecting one another, particularly if you got a strong-minded, strong-willed girl and she's always dominating the little boys in her group, she's potentially going to grow up to be a single woman. Oh. It's very true. Yeah, that's very true. Because you know, don't, I, no man want no woman that's going to always try and control him and take his manhood away from him. That's right. Amen. I, I I agree. Um, I want to go back to when you were talking about respect of your body, and, and I don't know if any of you saw on Facebook the somebody videotape where it said he wanted a stripper for his birthday party. So they had these girls on the pole, 
I mean, they were doing that thing. They were shaking it. They were twerking it, doing it. And all of a sudden, this little boy, he looked like he may be about five years old. Somebody's pushing him up there, and he's putting money in their underwear. He was the wow. one that wow. had the birthday party. And I was saying, oh, my goodness, who is teaching this little boy this? Who, and you see all these people, all these adults standing around laughing and cheering this little five-year-old boy on. Who else was at this birthday party? How many other children were at this birthday party? Why were these girls up on this pole and you see this little four or five-year-old putting money in your underwear and you don't have respect enough for yourself? Mm, mm, wow. It's been a week. It's been a week. <laughs> the things I've seen. Wow. And I'm saying, I cannot believe. And the little boy's looking back like, what do I do? What do I do? And they're showing him, put the money in her underwear. And the girl stood there and twerked it, and he put the money in her underwear. And they're giving him more money, and he's putting the money in her underwear. And I'm saying, oh, my God, help us. Help us. How many wow. other children are at this birthday party? You can't tell me this little boy thought it was all by himself. He's being taught. Who's trying to learn him? Mm. What mother, father, whoever is raising this child? What are you thinking that you would go through with this? And so so probably because so that's their lifestyle. Yeah, mm. I, and I'm I'm just sitting here thinking what happens when that little boy becomes of age. And he meets yes. my daughter. Yes. What? Thank you. You know, he runs into my granddaughter. That's right. My niece. That's right. Exactly. My grandchild. Yes. What then? What, mm. What's going to happen? He's on the playground. What happens then? Well, so, you know, Tony, this reminds me of when you go right back to the HB2 and what we were discussing, you know, about these decisions that they're making along the way. Everybody is conforming. People are conforming now. You see this happening. They're conforming and they are conforming their minds to what is abnormal, literally. Well, I, this, I is think become, this is all becoming a normal way of life, practically, literally. Yeah, it's sad. It's sad. It is. And, and the only answer is to draw these children to a place where they early in life come into a real and authentic relationship with God. And we yes. can't, as those who profess to be part of the body of Christ, we can't get them there if we continue playing church on Sunday and coming mm-hmm. home cussing like sailors on, 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 on Monday and, and Sunday popping night. them back and popping pop pop top and, and getting drunk and tipsy, you know, at the barbecue with the young people around because they're going to learn to go to church on Sundays and play the game too. You know, we can't Sorry. get in church and, and it's all about – you know, call me this, call me that while we're here. Call me this while we're at this church. But when we go to that church, call me something else. And by the way, when we get to the church down the street and you see the holy ones come around, you can't call me that at all. You just got to call me, you know, brother. So, okay. Now, I'm just being real because, see, that's what our mind is on when we walk into that church building. See, these young people are counting on us to walk in the building with the church in us because that's where they get their understanding and their perception of the church from. It's how we act when we get in there and how we act when we come out. That's right. That's right. Mm, so let's talk profound. about uh, Mr. Ralph Richard Banks and his suggestion that black women should look to other races for potential mates because there aren't enough black men to go around. Well, first of all, uh, Tony, you do remember Daryl made mention of the fact that that is an absolute myth, that there are plenty of black men out there that are college-bound, college graduates. They're doing their thing. The statistics that are out have been, you know, they're, they're not correct. They're wrong. So well, I think yeah, people are I- looking in all the right places. Yeah, his his comments were with regard to that statistic about there being more black men in prison than they are in universities. See, my point is that just because a black man is in prison does not mean that he does not exist. So there is not a shortage on black men. That's why 
the answer starts with catching these young boys before they grow up to be prison material. Mm-hmm. That's right. I think um, one of the things that, that, that black men or black, black boys, uh, one of the things we need is a, is a demonstration. Authenticity to me is, is, is extremely underrated. And, and, you know, youth, particularly uh, black boys, gravitate to people that they feel are real, that they feel are authentic. This is why they gravitate to the drug dealers and the guy corner and, 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 and the hustlers, and this is why they gravitate to them, because they feel like they're real. Well, the truth of the matter is, is there are, there are uh, CEOs and entrepreneurs and business professionals that are just as real. Uh, the, the problem is, 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 is sometimes we, we get out of the hood and we never come back. And so I think um, it, takes, it takes those of us that are doing the right thing and that are positive examples uh, to the community at large, to, to, to black young boys, uh, going in and being a demonstration of what uh, positive authenticity looks like and say, hey, you, you, are, you may have been through some things, but, but you are not your mistakes, you are not your failures. And, and there's, a, there's a better way of doing things than what you may see commonplace all the time. There's a better way. So I think um, it really just goes back to, to, to my comment earlier, and it should be an example, being, a, being available and being, and being pliable. But, but young black boys, really need to see uh, more of an alternative than what they see more times than not. And that's good stuff. Let me tell you what I picked up. The the, the immediate thing that popped into my mind when you uh, began speaking and you talked about the authenticity and being available, and then I started thinking about, Latanya, something you said with regard to the church. Now, have you noticed this trend in churches now? And I have to signal out the black church because that's what I'm a part of. And even when I go and I do the uh, church consultations where I'm that shopper, secret shopper, if you will, in the church to really see if your mission and vision statement is what people truly experience when they walk in the church. And so now I'm thinking about that black male pastor who's on the platform and he's supposed to be the example of uh, shepherding and of covering over um, the family, the family unit. And so if he is that shepherd, that covering over the family unit, um, we want our children to look up to him as a spiritual leader. But that's but right. Then, but then I, I get to what Rodney just said about that authenticity, the positive authenticity and the availability. And then I think about the armor bear. Then I think about the fact that oh, wow. can even get a handshake. He can't even get a handshake. I mean, th- th- this is, I mean, and this is real talk. It- it's not in all churches. But once no. these spiritual leaders reach a level, they can't even, mm-hmm. y- they can't, they can't even shake their hand. You-, you can't get to them. So that's my problem. Absolutely. With this, this, this misguided focus, okay, and I think the word we used last week was you're out of order. It's all out of order. Mm. Yeah, and no, meanwhile... Yeah. Meanwhile, our sons and daughters are living a single life to death. They're dying by themselves. Oh. They're, they're, they're being put in nursing homes because there's nobody else to take care of them. And right. if they don't have any children that they have had relationship with along the way, then guess what? They go to the grave by themselves. Back to the scripture, it is tough. It's a cold and lonely, unprotected life, and that's what we do when we don't have that authenticity of relationship, the availability, real examples that they can connect with and that they can touch. Reading the book by itself is not going to do it. They need real life examples, someone that they can touch. We've run out of time. Uh, Does anyone have any closing remarks they'd like to add before we close out? I just want to say something that I've heard quite often in, in different, different places, and that is the time, talk, and the touch. And putting in that time with our young people, having the uh, access to them to building relationships like Rodney had made mention, and then touching their lives in ways where we are willing to make ourselves available by sacrificing some of our time, some of our talent, and some of our resources as well that don't necessarily go into the church, but we build these young people that they may become 
the church, that they may become good citizens, that they may become good people of good character. That's good stuff. Amen. Jackie, any parting words from you? Well, you know, I always have a question. (laughs) (laughs) Here we go. (laughs) You know, how do I teach you when I need to be taught myself? Where do I go? How How do I start? Where do I go? Help me, because... I'm going to I'm going to the old man over there that thinks I look good in the high heel shoes. He gonna sit me on the corner and tell me everything he knows. And then I'm gonna go and I'm gonna teach that to somebody else. So where does the cycle break? When does who do you go to? Where does it start? Yeah, that's a real good question and we're gonna answer that next week and more. So until then, we're signing off Brave Talk Radio. You are listening to Brave Talk Radio at TonyEmmahale.com.